just came to magnify. I just came to glorify. I just came to praise the Lord. For he is worthy. Worthy of all my praise. For he is worthy. Worthy of all my Worthy of all my praise, for he is worthy. Worthy of all my praise. Never will a rock cry out in my place. He's worthy of all my praise. I just came to magnify. I just came to glorify. I just came to praise the Lord. Amen. Anybody come to magnify the Lord and praise his holy name this morning. I come to worship him for he is worthy of all our praise. Psalm 92 says it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. To show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. I mean, no God is faithful to us. And so we want to praise him this morning. So Psalm 95 says, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. And let us make a joyful noise. I hope we got some noise makers that will make a yeah. joyful noise unto the Lord this morning. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. And make a joyful noise unto him with psalm. We come to open up our mouths and give him the fruit of our lips. For another week he has kept us. And so we want to just bless him this morning. Hallelujah. In Psalm 91 that says that he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress and he is my God. I don't know what you can say about him, but that's what I can say about the Lord this morning. That he is my refuge, he is my God. And so we want to bless him this morning. God, in the name of Jesus, we come to bless you and to praise you and give you glory. We praise you, God, that you have and are our peace in this time of storm, that you are our anchor, that you are a rock that we can stand upon. We thank you, God, that we don't have to face this life by ourselves, that you walk with us, that you are a very present help in the time of trouble that you are always with us and your word says that you would never leave us nor forsake us so no matter what we come up against God we know that you are with us and while you may not deliver us you go through it with us and so we just want to praise you just for another day that we have come we thank you for the health and strength we thank you for the mind of being able to come out and serve you God we want to thank you for being our provider. We thank you for being our healer. We want to thank you for being our deliverer. We want to thank you for being our way maker. We want to thank you for being the source of our supply. We give man credit for nothing because, God, everything comes from you. You say every good and every perfect gift comes from you. So we want to bless you this morning. We invite you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to come and move among your people right now. Holy Spirit, move among us now in the name of Jesus. Have your way in this place. Do what you want to do, God, in the name of Jesus. We come to worship you. We come to seek your face. We come to bless your name. So we invite you to come and reign and move among your people right now. May the fruit of our lips, may the words of our mouths be acceptable to you, O oh God, my Redeemer. We bless you, God. Just thank you for another day's journey that we were able to get up this morning. Thank you for guiding us here and protecting us and, and for the food on our table. God, you are a merciful God. Hallelujah. And you are mighty God. You are loving God. And again, you are a faithful God. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise His name. He is here. 
worship Him. He is He.
depend on God. I can depend on God. Yeah. I can depend on God. I can depend on God. I can depend on God.
Just because you are God and because, just because, Lord, it is thy presence that we seek today. It is your strength that our soul craves. It is the comfort of your love that we need. God, gird us up by your presence. Manifest yourself afresh that we may know you, that we may see you, that we may experience you. You are a great Father. You are a great God. You have made us to have communion and fellowship with you. Sometimes, Lord, the cares of this world tend to cloud our fellowship. But God, we ask today, if you lift the cloud and break through with the radiant sunlight of your presence, just because you can and just because you are God. God, as we stand here, we ask that you would strengthen us as you always do. Bring clarity to our mind, ordinance to our speech. And God, discipline us, our tongue, that we may speak with boldness that which you have given me as you have given it to me. In the name of Jesus, our Christ, we pray, amen. 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 Good morning. <clears throat> well, what a great day to be alive. But even a better day to know that our Redeemer liveth and he lives in us. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Praise our God. I pray that all is well with you as we celebrate this Independence Day. 
this 4th of July weekend. Truly God is great and greatly to be praised. I caution you that as you celebrate, don't let your patriotism define your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ or be tempted to worship the flag at the expense of bound before the cross. Because God, you are good. You are our maker. We know that kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. Nations come and nations go. But you tell us there will be no end to your kingdom. And it's to your glory. It is to the cross of Christ that we pledge our undying allegiance. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. That is your Independence Day message. That's your Independence Day message. This morning, we'll be talking from the epistle of 1 John, chapter 3, verse 21 through 22. In particular, and 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 through 15. A text will be 1 John, the epistle of John. The little book's in the back, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. The epistle of 1 John chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. And also 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. In 1 John chapter 3, let, let, me, let me go back. In 1 John chapter 3, 21, 22 said, Beloved, if our heart do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and so please him. John 5, 1 John 5, 14 and 15, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, and whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Beloved, if our heart do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and so please him. And this is this confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, and whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we've asked of him. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 21 of our text, we see two words that draws our attention. Condemn and confidence. That's what the Spirit would have us talk about this morning from a subject, condemnation and confidence, or condemnation versus confidence. Condemnation comes from the word to condemn, is an act of saying that something or someone is very bad and as such unacceptable. It's denunciation, blame, censure, disapproval. It means pronounced sentence or cast judgment. Confidence, the state of feeling certain about the truth of something. A feeling of self-assurance arising from one's appreciation of one's own abilities or qualities. In this text, we see both words, but it together. Condemnation and confidence. Both cannot coexist. <laughs> in the same place at the same time. Either we're under condemnation or we're not. 
If we're under it, there is no sense of confidence. If we, if we, if we, if we have confidence, then we are not under condemnation. We're going to find out that many people position themselves under condemnation where God has not placed them. And the, back, the background of our text is this. At the time of the writing, John is now an old man. I do not know if it was written before, during, or after he was banished to the Isle of Patmos. That's what you might ask Dr. Professor Beale. I just don't know. This Isle of Patmos, a rock quarry in the midst of the Aegean Sea, uh, on the coast of Ephesus, the place where John pastored. The island of Patmos was known as the dying place because no one banished there ever returned. Just because they hadn't, it doesn't mean you couldn't. God can do whatever he wants to do. If he places you there, he has the power to bring you through and bring you out. I don't know where you are today. You may be on your Patmos in the midst of a hard place, in the midst of a harsh place. But as John was, you can still be in the spirit on the Lord's day. And that spirit can lift you out of the place where you are to see and experience things in God you never thought you could see. In this epistle, John writes a a word of encouragement or sermon, rather, than an instructional letter. It's filled with inspiration and reassurance about the love of the truth of the gospel of God. In it, he addresses such themes as love versus hate, light versus darkness, righteousness versus unrighteousness, and Christ versus Antichrist. It appears to be a combination or summation of all that he has heard, seen, and witnessed of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the opening preamble to this book, verses 1 through 4. It said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest And we have seen it and testified of it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Not just our joy, but your joy may be complete. That's that's John's desire. That's John's desire here. In the days and moments leading up to this service today, I have been hearing in my mind and in my spirit the word demonstration. Demonstration, demonstration. Not demonstration in the sense of a protest, but in the biblical sense that Jesus went throughout all Galilee and Capernaum doing good. He said preaching and teaching, healing the sick and casting out demons. And the word says he healed all that was brought to him of whatever diseases they had. Here's the pattern that he follows. Preaching, teaching, demonstration. Can I say it again? Preaching, teaching, and demonstration. Preaching and teaching without demonstration leads to frustration. And the scriptural text, or, or, or I could say the word that came unto me saying, has been 1 John 3, 21 and 22. 
The word has come to me saying this over and over. He said, beloved, if our heart does not condemn us. He said, beloved, if your heart does not condemn you. Some versions say, if our conscience does not condemn us. We have <clears throat> confidence before God. Can I say that again? This, this, this word of the Lord have been coming to me, waking me up and, 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 and touching my deepest part of my soul. Saying, beloved, if your heart does not condemn you, if your conscience does not condemn you, you have confidence before me. And whatever you ask, you receive of him because you keep his commandments and do please him. These two verses have spanned, spawned other verses, but it's in these that have, but it's these that have captured my thoughts and arrested my mind. I believe I'm hearing uh, this. We have been preaching and teaching Marlene long enough it's time for demonstration, demonstration, demonstration. I firmly believe God brought us here this morning to do something special. I don't know exactly what it is, but you are sitting in the midst of the moment of demonstration. Whatever your dilemma is, maybe the release from that may be the word made flesh or demonstrate. Whatever it is, the spirit appears to be saying, let go, back up, allow me to demonstrate what you've been preaching and teaching. Verse 23 goes on to say, ask whatever you will, or may say in my name, and it will be done unto you. Not might, it will be done, ask according to my will. He said, ask what according to my will. How do I know what is that will? Now we'll come back to that as time permits. The verse also says, if your heart, your conscience, does not condemn you. However, I must admit that I've had some difficulty with this part of this verse. If your conscience does not condemn. I, say, I said in my spirit, and the Lord heard me. I didn't utter it, but he heard me. I said, some people do not have a conscience. Their conscience have been seared as with a hot iron. They're like the prophet Jeremiah says in the book of Lamentations, their past feeling. The Lord spoke to my heart and said, I am not talking about them. They have no standing before me. I am talking about my children, those who love me and those who keep my commandments. Let's look at the primary text again. If our conscience or our heart does not condemn us, whatever I ask, according to his will, I shall have it because we, have, we love and keep his commandment. It's time for demonstration of that which have been preached and taught. It is time for somebody to be delivered. Some sick bodies heal, some evil spirits silence, and some devils cast out. But first we've got to try and deal with the conscious, uh, with the conscious and the condemnation, the confidence. The picture is this. My spirit man, Justin, already stands before him, God, the Father, in his holy tribunal. And then speaks to my mind, my soul, the seat of the will, my intellect, my emotion, before I even open my mouth unto the Lord. This is the picture. This is the picture. Before I open my mouth, there's already a conversation in heaven. My, 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 my spirit man is already standing before God and his holy tribunal. 
And before I speak, he's already dialoguing. Since, 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 my, uh, uh, since my soul is a seat of my conscience, if my conscience does not condemn me, then I know that whatsoever I ask, I shall have. I know that the conversation went well, and now I can pray with confidence that God will grant what my request is. But if it doesn't go well, I'm unstable. I don't have the confidence. The Bible says, who can know the mind or the thoughts of a man but the spirit of the man? And who can know the mind of God but the spirit of God? This is what separates the non-believer from the believer. The non-believer cannot know the will of God for his life unless someone tells him. If you're a non-believer, hold on, don't, don't panic. There's something here for you also. Because you got some believers around you that can converse with God on your behalf. The believer knows because the Spirit of God lives in the heart and the mind of the man testifying to the spirit of man about the will of God. Before I opened my mouth, I said, there's already a conversation. That's what Jesus, he said, he said, I only do that which I see my father doing. I only do that which I see my father already doing. I only do that which I see and he have already been approved in heaven. Oh, Lord, before I open my mouth, there is already a conversation going on in heaven. John says in 1 John 4 and 8 that there are three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood. In my mind, I imagine it goes something like this. The spirit says, I know him, and he knows me. The water says, I baptized him. And the blood says, I covered and sanctified him. Romans 8 and 1, the apostle Paul tells us, there's therefore no condemnation to them who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And so in John 1, John 3 and 2, he prefaced what I just read in the text. Beloved, we are God's children. In verse 6, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning, no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Spurgeon says, if the grace that saved you was not enough to change you, then it wasn't enough to to save you either. The problem is many believers, though born again, blood washed and sanctified, still maintain George a sinner's mentality. In sight of being saved, born again, They still live under the spirit of condemnation. Even though the word clearly says, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life uh, set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Even the word itself testifies that the Father does not condemn them. They persist to live under condemnation. They still live with the fear of going to hell. Continue to live with the feeling that that they're just not good enough. Just not saved enough. Just not perfect enough. Just not pleasing to God. They refuse to, to let themselves walk in the blessedness of their salvation or partake of the precious promises given to everyone that believe on the name of Jesus. Many believers do not comprehend fully what is the height, the breadth, and the depth of the love of God. As long as one thinks and believes like a sinner, they can never have the confidence that God hears, and if he hears, he will have whatever he has. He is not waiting to punish the sinner. That ought to be some good news. He's not waiting to punish the believer. The born again believer that it, he, he, God, has already punished him in the sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus on the cross. Can I help some believer that's living in fear? I came to tell you this morning, the Lord will have me tell you that 
no matter where you are, he's not waiting to punish you. Because he's already punished you in his son Jesus Christ on the cross. Oh, y'all, y'all ain't hear me. Because you couldn't have handled it anyway. He punished Jesus, poured his wrath out on him, that everyone who believed on him should not have to suffer the punishment. He sacrificed his life. The word for sacrifice comes from the word meaning to make sacred. You and I ought to live a sacrificial life. Take up our cross daily and follow him. See, sacrifice uh, 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 makes sacred uh, that which the sacrifice provided. When Jesus died on the cross, he sacrificed his life that he make, make us sacred in the eyes of God. I don't believe you'll hear me. When he died, when he died, a sinner like me had the opportunity through faith become sacred like him. Oh, Lord, can I, can I say it? See, you're just not any old thing. See, the sacrifice made you special. Do you feel special today? Somebody say, I am sacred in the eyes of God. Now, if you're sacred in the eyes of God, you need to learn to be sacred in your own eyes. I'm just not any old trash out here. I am something special. Now, on the contrary, the non-believer, the one who refuses to believe, the Bible says in, in, in Romans 3, 17, 18, 19. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. But whoever believeth in him, believeth, not, believeth in him is not condemned. But whoever believeth not or refuses to believe is condemned already. James the Apostle tells us something like this in, in, in chapter 1, 5, 6, 7, and 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally to all without reproach and will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For one who doubts is like a wave of sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Whenever our heart condemns us, remember God is greater than our hearts. He knows everything. Can I say it again? Whenever our heart becomes misguided, fail to appropriate that which has been appropriated for us. Always remember that God has the last word. He's greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. He knows your weakness. He knows the moments of your strength. He knows your weeping. He knows your doubts and your fears. In spite of all of that, he tells us, I hear you. Whenever our hearts condemn us, sometime when we're going through, we're our worst enemy. We don't give ourselves a break. We're always blaming ourselves for something going on. And we've got to start blaming God, I must be punished for something else. No, that has nothing to do with anything. God knows everything. We don't know anything really, but he knows everything. Before one can have confidence in his or her standing before God, condemnation must be dealt with. Confidence cannot thrive and produce the sweet harvest of faith. As long as there is condemnation around, the sinner must be saved by confession of the Lord Jesus and the shed blood, and the saint must believe that there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Sometimes it's hard to believe, but you must believe because the word says it. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. In the Gospel of John, chapter 5, 14, verse, chapter 5, 14 and 15, part of our text read, and this is the confidence that we have toward him. That if we ask, here it is, according to his will. Don't make that a stumbling block, but just stay right here with me. But if we ask, 
according to his will, we shall, we shall have what we have. There it is according to his will. What is his will and how do I know what it is? I'm glad somebody asked that. What is his will? His will is his word revealed in the word of God that we call the Bible. The Bible is his will. There's an Old Testament will and there's a New Testament will. Whatever is in the will was left on record for you and I. Y'all not hearing me. See, when Jesus died, in the interim between he died and got up, we became beneficiaries of the will. Y'all hear me? When he died, see, because all things belong to the Father, the Father gave to him, and he asked the Father to declare it unto us. And so when he died, the will came in force. Y'all ain't hearing me. And we became beneficiaries of this extravagant will. But we had a double take because when he got up, the will was already in force. Somebody say amen in here. And so if you have the word, you have the will. In, 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 in. But, 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 but. How do I know his will? All right. The simplest way is to know him. Amen. In 1 John 2, 3, and 4, and by this we know that we have come to know him Amen. if we keep his commandments. Amen. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Amen. But whoever keeps his word Amen. in him, truly the Lord of God, the love of God is perfected. The evidence of someone knowing God and fellowshipping with him is that he keeps his commandments. A simple loving obedience is the natural result of the fellowship with God. Do you really know what the highest praise you can give to God? It's not just saying hallelujah, but it is a, it is a life lived in the spirit. Y'all, amen. Because, it is, because a life lived in the spirit glorifies God. The purpose of praise is to glorify God. If I walk in the spirit, walk in holiness, I glorify God just as much or more as if I shout hallelujah. Many people shout hallelujah, but they don't have the real praise. The purpose of the praise if to glorify God. Amen. If he dance, is to glorify God. Amen. If you sing, is to glorify God. Amen. But the life you live Amen. is to glorify God. Amen. Your daily walk is your daily praise. Somebody shout amen in here. I may not open my mouth, but I've been praising all day long. I, I may not have the energy to dance around the room, but, but I've been praising all day long. I was praising when I got up, praising when I walked all through the day, praising when I laid down. Why? Not because of what I said, but because I walked in the holiness of God. Mm, somebody say, somebody say amen. 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 The evidence of someone knowing God and fellowshipping with him is that he keeps his commandment. A simple loving obedience is the natural result of fellowship with God. By this, John said, we know. This, that we know. The word for know have here is, is to know by experience. Experience comes from fellowship with. The spirit with him and in his presence. It means to have an experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ. So I know the will of God by knowing God experientially. Many people try to know God by reading. You'll never find him really by leading. But you come to know God experientially. The joys that you went through. And the Lord was right there with you. The valleys that you went through. And the Lord brought you through. The, thing, the, the, the high places that you experienced and you saw the Lord in the midst of this. The losses that you suffered and God still made a way somewhere. 
We learn and we know him experientially. Do you have an experience with him? See, experientially comes from time spent fellowship with. You can't worship every now and then and have an experience with God. Your life must be a life of worship, a life of fellowshipping with God and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Many people think they can come to church every once in a while, open a Bible every once in a while, read a verse they don't understand every once in a while, take communion every once in a while, and feel like they know God. But you don't know God, really, Dr. Bill, until you've really been down and you couldn't even find yourself. When you've been down in your night so dark that you can't see your hand in front of your face, when, you, when your heart want to give up and your soul stands on the ledge of life, ready to jump off and take its life, and God still holds you into balance. You don't know God until you have been a believer and you stepped across the boundary and sinned the sin that you thought you should have never. And everybody looking down at you, but God does not ostracize you. He does not turn his back on you. God comes and walks with you and tells the world that he's still my own. Somebody say amen. See, you don't need a God to walk with you when you got other people walking with you. But when nobody will stand with you because your life now stinks to them. But God, the maker of the universe, the ruler of heaven and earth, our maker, our creator, our father comes down and identifies himself. Well, do you, I wonder, I wonder, do you know him? I wonder, do you know him? A lot of, lot of people know the devil better than they know the Lord because they're always talking about what the devil did. The devil did this to me this morning. The devil attacked me this morning. They better watch out. The devil will do whatever the devil can do this morning. I don't know why believers walk around afraid of the devil when Jesus already have his foot on the head of the devil. Reason why many people know the devil better than they know the Lord because they spend more time with the devil. Y'all ain't hearing me. The devil is the ruler of the world. If you spend your time meditating on the things of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, you'll get to know the devil better than you know the Lord. But if you seek the holiness of God, you come to know the Lord as he is. And whatever we ask, receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. In another place he says, and my commandments are not grievous. They're neither hard to do or hard to remember. John's not talking about the famous Ten Commandments of Moses that everybody get religious and talk about. Those we try to memorize and post wherever we go and say, oh, what a good boy I am. Or the 613 or more that the rabbinical law uh, distilled it down into. But really just one with two parts. Anybody ought to be remember one with two parts. And this is what it is. Here's a commandment. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. If you keep this, you don't have to worry about the other. It's right here. So somebody ought to get some breakthrough right here. Because you're thinking you didn't keep all of the commandments. But, but see, you don't even know what all of them were. Some of them had something to do with what you wore, how you wore it, and the, the, what you ate, what you did. Jesus said, that, that's something deeper than that. It, it's just right here. Love the Lord, thy God, with all thy heart. With all their might, the uh, law of their soul. And the second is like the first. Love the neighbor as thyself. Uh, so that ain't too hard, is it? Love the Lord. Who wouldn't love the Lord? He's altogether lovely, isn't it? Love the Lord, thy God, with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their might. And the second is like the first. Love their neighbor as thyself. This is the answer you recognize that, that Jesus gave the lawyer, which came to him in Matthew's gospel, believed and said, which master, Lord, which teacher, which is the greatest commandment? In our text, he said, love ye one another. 
So the one another is not just your saved brother or your fellow church members, but is extended to cover your neighbor without consideration of his faith, his lack of faith, or whatever. Neighbor is anything, anyone that, that you have access to or have knowledge of. If you know through, through media, he's your neighbor. If you know through whatever, he's your neighbor. So your neighbor is whoever that you have access to or knowledge of. And those neighbors, some of them got some issues. Somebody say amen. Some of them gay, some of them this, some of them that. Some of, them, some of them murderers, some of them thieves, some of them everything. But the Lord said, this, this is how you know. Love your neighbor as yourself. You mean you want me to love the whole monger? Love the neighbor. As, it shouldn't be too hard, Daniel, because you've been a bit of a whole monger yourself. Other folk just don't know it, but I know all about it. Love your neighbor. You mean the one down in the gut? Love your neighbor. Love the neighbor as yourself. Love the sinner. Love the sinner into redemption. This kind of love bears the image of the cross of, of Christ Jesus. The vertical dimension is our love for God. But the horizontal dimension is our love for one another. Many people want a vertical dimension, but it doesn't make a cross. You got to have the horizontal dimension to make the cross. Can I get with it? The vertical dimension is our love for God. We can guess to that. But what God is looking at is the horizontal commission. Because, because the proof of love to God is not what you say to him, but what you say to your brother. Oh, Lord. Huh? Not what you do to him, but what you do for your brother. So this is the confidence that we have. The, 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 toward him, God, that if we ask anything according to his will, his will, his word, he hears us. And if we know he hears us in whatever, somebody say, in whatever. I mean, somebody say whatever. I don't know whatever your whatever is, but God's ready to deal with it right now. You don't even have to tell me what the whatever is, but the word said, said he hears us. If we know he hears us in whatever. We ask, we know that we have a, the request that we have asked of him. Whatever you need, just ask of him. You know his will because you have just read from his last will and testament, the Holy Bible. You know that he hears you because you keep the commandments. And there you love the Lord, the God, with all your heart, body, and soul. And you love one another, love your neighbor as yourself. I believe this morning, Marlene, it's time for demonstration. The Apostle John uses this theme of asking and receiving a lot. And in, in, in fact, he used it two times in this epistle of John. First in chapter 3 and again in chapter 5. He uses it in chapter 15 of the Gospel of John in verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you will, and it, was, and it will be done unto you. Here he is quoting the words of the Lord Jesus. In verse 8 of chapter 15, the Gospel of John, again quoting Jesus, By this my Father is glorified, or made known to human understanding, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciple. Verse 10 of the Gospel of John said, If you keep my commandments, and abide in his love, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy, here it is, may be in you, and your joy may be fulfilled. He's not one us burdened down by heavy weights and, and the cares of the world. He wants our joy to be full. I don't know about you this morning, but I have a few things in my life, and a few things that, 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 that I see maybe zapping joy in your heart, dimming the sparkle from your eye, taking the pep out of your step, bending your back by the weight down to the ground and bowing your head down before him that I'm not happy about. I don't get the joy out of that. Anybody came in here this morning, something zapping your joy? I don't know what it is, but the Lord knows all about it. 
Look what, look what he says. He wants us to have joy. Look what he said. Look, what, look, look at If you buy to me these things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be fulfilled in you, and your joy may be full. I want the joy of Jesus. I want the joy of a, of a fruitful life. I want the joy of being to walk in the sunshine of God's glory. I want the joy of being able to take these burdens off my back. I want the joy of being able to lift the burdens off of your back. I want the joy to see your sadness turn to joy. I want the joy to see the smile come back on your face. I want the joy to see the sparkle return, the bent down back straighten up, and the head that was bowed low. I want the joy. I want to see that joy this moment. It's mine. He said, he said, in the gospel, he said, John said, in verse 1, we read, all that, all that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Yeah. Oh, I don't believe you're catching. This is what Jesus said. This is part of his going away message just before the crucifixion. He tells them, all that the Father has is mine. He said, this is what I've done since it's mine. I've asked the Father to take what is mine and declare it to you. Think about declares when you're making a trip on an airplane in a foreign country. You've got to declare what you picked up while you were there. If you go down to Mexico, you've got a declaration form. You declare everything that you picked up. Somebody say amen here. See, see, when Jesus died, everything that the Father gave him, he asked the Father to declare it to me. He made a declaration. And so in the declaration, Marlene, he gave healing. So healing is mine. In the declaration, he gave deliverance. So deliverance is mine. In the declaration, the ability to heal is mine. Not only be healed, but to heal. In the declaration, the ability to deliver and be delivered is mine. In the declaration, the ability to have joy in the midst of stress is mine. In the midst of the declaration, the ability to speak to demons in hell and they flee from me is mine. In the declaration, the, the ability to speak to your burdens and speak to yours by the power of the Holy Spirit. Tell the lame man, get up and walk. The declaration is mine. To the bowed down head, lift up your head. Oh, ye gates and the king of glory shall come in. See, the declaration is mine, and that which is mine is yours also. I came not to give it to you, but to remind you that you have what I have, and I have what he has, and he has what the Father. So he says, so he says, it's time for demonstration. You heard the preached word. You've been taught the word of God, that you ask whatever you will and shall be. You, you've been taught that. You, you haven't been out of here long enough for that to have left your spirit yet. It's still on you and in you right now. So no matter who you are, wherever you sit, whatever your whatever is, I want to speak to that whatever right now. Somebody has sickness in their body. The doctor says, I have some in mind, but God knows I can't tell. I feel better than I felt before I found out I had it. Somebody say amen. So I, I've heard some stuff, but I also heard another voice from God. The word said, thou art healed and delivered. Lord, Lord, have mercy. Now, there's a lot going on in your life, but the Lord gave us speaking power. Anybody want to speak to speaking power? In this house. There's somebody today that's got sickness in their body and you're tired of having it. God can't get delivered until you want it to go. In the name of Jesus, tear us up. I declare healness where there's sickness. Somebody is bound down by an addiction. I declare deliverance by the power of the Holy Spirit. Somebody lost their joy. I declare joy in the midst of sorrow. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Somebody say demonstrate. Demonstrate. Lord, we step back out of the way. You demonstrate. 
You are the healer. You are the liver. You demonstrate. You demonstrate. You demonstrate that men may see your glory. Oh, hallelujah. 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 I, I feel, and I hope you do too, I feel good down in my sanctified soul. In fact, I don't know when I felt better. I got a joy that surpasses all understanding. Not because everything is right in my eyes, but because I know God handles everything. Somebody shout amen in here. Somebody ought to see the glory of God in here today. Only God have power to mend a broken heart. Only God have power to lift us up when we're down. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Only you know the mind of God. Holy Spirit. Examine our hearts. And speak to our spirit. From the spirit of man knows the Amen. mind of the man. Amen. Whatever's not right, Amen. cleanse it Amen. by the blood, precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. God, we want to be instruments yes. of your glory. Yes. Bless your people. Yes. Bless us. Yes. In the awesome name of Jesus. Now, if you're watching by YouTube, by Facebook, this is for you. The declaration upon your life has been spoken. Walk in your deliverance. Walk in your wholeness. Abide in the presence of God. Let his word saturate you. Let his love warmth you. Let his blood cleanse you. Bless the Lord. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth from all generations. In Mark's gospel, chapter 2, it says when it was rumored that Jesus was in the house, people came from every city out of Galilee, Samaria, Judea, Doctors of the law, Pharisees, came to the house. There was no room to get in. And he says, and there, a man sick of the palsy, paralyzed. Came being brought by four on a stretcher. And they had a singular purpose and a common goal. That singular purpose was to glorify Jesus. Because as you get to the end of that story, it says, and they all glorified him. Because they've never seen it that way before. Somebody needs to see the manifestation today in a way that you've never seen it before. They had a common purpose was to bring men to the presence of Jesus. That's why we gather today to bring others to the presence of Jesus. He is in the house because his word is in the house. He's in the house because we invited him in the house. They brought this man to him. Lord him down, George. <coughs> It always fascinates me. I don't know whether the man ever asked to come to church. <clears throat> but they brought him. You can bring him by prayer. Somebody brought somebody today by prayer. And I don't know whether the man was saved or not. <clears throat> Probably not. <clears throat> but because when, when Jesus looked up at what they had gone through to get the man to him, he says to the men, your faith has made him whole. If you have faith enough to bring someone by prayer or whatever 
to the presence of God. He looks not at them, but uses your action and call it faith. Have you brought somebody today on your heart in your prayer? He wants to see you, that he may speak to you before he speaks to that condition. There's one who come at the end of that wits, don't even know how to get through the day let alone get tomorrow. They wondering how they even got here. You came by divine appointment. You received an invitation from the Lord himself and you did not turn it away. If you're here, just need a little help. You come to the right place. That me and your sisters and brothers, we may lift your cause before him. That however you came in, you'll go out better. And the thing about it, be so mysterious, you won't know how it happened, when it happened. Can I tell you something else? That man didn't have to do a thing. He was blessed because those who loved him did something. Do I have any parent that want to bring somebody's child to the Lord? I said that way because I don't want people to think it's yours. Do I have any parent here that want to bring somebody's child to the Lord? If you're here, won't you just come? Make yourself visible. And may God may look at your faith. Anybody have a sister or brother? that they want to bring to the Lord. God wants to honor your faith. He wants to look at you and see your faith have made thee whole. Anybody have a friend that they just want to bring to the Lord? In, 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 in Luke's account of this story, it says, in the power of God was present to heal them all. In this house, the power of God is present this morning to heal and deliver every one of us. Even those who have issues that nobody knows. In fact, we may have issues that we don't know. But the word that come to me saying now is that the power of God is present to heal all that come. He's looking at your faith. So many of you are bringing, perhaps on a stretcher, in the spirit. Somebody that can't bring themselves. Bring them into the presence of, not my presence, but the presence of the Lord. And the Lord is looking at you. And he says, it don't look like much, but because you were willing to kneel down together, take a hold of the man's condition and stand up together and walk with him together and climb up together according to that kind of faith. This man, this woman is delivered. Oh, Lord. God, our Father, Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Father even of my mama and my daddy, and those who go back beyond them. As we look, God, you've been with us all the days of our life. You've known us before the dawn of creation. You had a purpose for us before we breathed our first breath. God, you've known us in our searching moments, in our dark moments. Even when we felt alone, that's when you never left or forsook us. 
God, we thank you for the power of your word. We thank you for knowing your will, for having your will. We thank you, God, that we keep your commandments, that we love you with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, and all of our mind. And we love one another. The proof is, Lord, we brought one another here with us. We brought our friends. We brought our sons, our daughters. We brought our family. We brought them to stand right here. Lord God, on the, on the strength of our coming, on the strength of our bringing, on the strength of us lifting that issues above us to get in the presence of your son Jesus, heal and deliver right now. Heal the broken heart and mend the broken spirit. Set the captives free. Make ways out of no way. In the name of Jesus, we declare. We declare it. We declare it. We declare it. That whatsoever we ask, it shall be done. Because we, in the, according to the will of God, which we know, and because we have kept his commandment. In the name of Jesus, we declare it. We know he hears us and we walk away delivered from whatever held us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. As you, as you go back to your seat, feel free within reason to love on one another. Because that is the proof that you know and love God that you love one another. They don't have to do anything to make you love them. You just love them because God loves them. God is love. Mm. They don't have to be saved for you to love them. They don't have to, you don't have to even, they don't even have to like you for you to love them. I know love can break down some major barriers. nation, a royal priesthood. Priests own no possessions that sell. They offer sacrifices. We were made for sacrifice. Then in the sacrifice of praise, others be made sacred by the blood of Jesus. Just give yourself away. There are some things that rock our very foundation, but our Lord is still bigger than that. Mm. Lord, let us experience your love. Love on us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. We love on you. Breathe on us. Breathe on us. Breathe on us. Hold us. Embrace us as we embrace you. Kiss upon our cheek. Wipe the tears from our eyes. Lord, love on us. Draw near. Cover us. Cover us. Rekindle the fire within our hearts. Mm.
that you prosper. Be in health, even as your soul prospers. For God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. Who shall believe should not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, by gracing us with your presence. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless you. Deacon Pierce, who's the designated? We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. We have a double opportunity to be delivered today. But this which we're about to celebrate is not just a ritual to be observed, but it's a blessing itself to be received. Deacon and Mrs. Johns. Glory to God. It gave me great pleasure and privilege to have to do the communion for God's people. Now God fixed my stomach for us so I can do that perfect well. It was Passover when Jesus and his disciples uh, asked, came to the town and asked a gentleman for his upper chamber where they will celebrate the Passover. After the Passover, Jesus, where well, was two elements. There was bread. He took the bread and broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you in the remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the blood, he poured it, he supped it, and said, drank it. This is a cup of the New Testament, this doing the memories of me. So as we take, take the elements, let us not for, forget the Finished work of the cross, the, the, the blood was washed and saved us, and to the, to the bread, to represent his body. Be asked, can you pray for that? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, that you thought it not robbery to send your son, Jesus the Christ, that we may be made whole. We thank you, Father, for the two elements that we have here on today. You said as often as we do this, to do this in remembrance of you. We thank you for the blood that was shed, the blood that um, eradicates the sin of this world, Father. We thank you, dear Lord, that you knew from the foundation of this world that the, the blood of lambs and bullocks, that it was not enough, but you sent your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, so that it would not just cover, but it would cleanse us of all unrighteousness, Father. We thank you that we can come to receive healing at the table, Father. We thank you that we can come to be saved and be delivered at the table. We thank you, dear Lord, for what you did on the cross that your body was broken dear Lord and because of what you did on the cross dear Lord we have the right to eternal life and we just thank you and we praise you and we're doing this in remembrance of you in Jesus name we pray amen, amen. let us all stand
the bread represents the body of Jesus Christ. Let us all eat the bread. About the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Let all commune together. And they gathered, and we're going to sing a song.